Okay, with a different camera shot. There's my in-scale New South Wales D57, sitting on an HO scale section of my layout, which I call Wombat Flats. That's actually sitting on the check rails. So, um, the, the photographics in the background are photos I've actually taken. It's about 5-10 minutes from where I live, or exist at least. But I can teach people how to do scenery like this. The wing walls, which are the wooden retaining planks, are only done out of balsa wood. The um, limestone blocks in the middle are actually uh, 42 by 19 dressed pine, cut to height. Actually not 42 by 19, I think 65, something like that. In any case, it was 19 mil, but bandsaw down the guts and uh, made it to, I think, down to 12, I think it is, 12 mil wide. But it runs the full width of both tracks. And then I just wrapped the um, limestone paper wrapping around it. Underneath the plywood deck is some jarra, which is bandsawed through. And I've cut the, the um, width of the um, jarra that I needed down into four equal strips. And they're evenly paced underneath. But anyway, that's me in scale D57. So the next camera shot, I'll show you what the HO scale one's now looking like. There yeah, my rubbishy backyard needs mowing. Been a lot of rain lately. Today's the first sunny day we've had in weeks. But there's the HO scale D57. I've just put Edge Primer on it prior to this video. And at least with that, you can get to see some of the detail that's on this locomotive. And while it's off the chassis, which you saw a moment ago inside, you can now see the cab detail. The foot plate on this is actually able to be moved. It's a little bit tighter than it was. But you can see the amount of cab detail which is in there. The driver's seats are in there. I've already got a crew for it. And they'll go into the loco once it's all painted. Had a couple of mild coats of uh, etch primer put onto it at this stage. Here in Australia, we've got a company called Super Cheap Auto for about 15 bucks or 13 to 15 Australian dollars. You can actually buy a aerosol can of uh, etch primer. And there's the tender by comparison. And this has been sitting out here in the sun for the last quarter of an hour, half an hour, drying. It's not necessarily the coolest or warmest of days. So it's just mild about 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. And in, in the kit, this would have been an open hole. So I just filled a bit of plastic at the back of it. But it's dead, dead simple. And to give you an idea, Sound of a graffiti artist. I'm, I'm currently using Australian Export brand. This is in matte black. That's what I'm going to be spraying on this loco. Give you an idea how quick and easy. Yeah, it's really starting to get that filthy look to it. For those who have never spray painted a loco before, this could be a new beginning for you. You don't have to spend two, three hundred odd dollars on an air compressor and all the gear to do it. Rattle cans do the same job. As long as you get it from all angles. Depending on the effect that you want. See, it doesn't take too long. It's starting to look like a loco, isn't it? So 
a eh, bit of a transformation before your eyes. That's all you need. Doesn't have to be spot on. By the time the weathering goes on, it looks like it's been super for a number of years. Let the overspray do the work. Now yeah, remember these things have a fan sort of spray. There's a, this one's set for vertical. You can turn that nozzle 45 degrees, uh, 90 degrees. Make it fan horizontal if you like. I see no point in that. You don't want to go too close with it. You get paint runs. There you go, folks. Oops, that's got it. And you must always remember these aerosol cans to save the, the nozzles getting clogged up. Turn the can upside down. Once the paint's finished, that's it. Done. Stay out here in the daylight for another quarter of an hour, half an hour. I'll give another light dusting, and then uh, we'll have ourselves a very close on being a fully finished model. The dustier and filthier looking it is, the better. So there you go, folks. Hope, hope this video has been entertaining for you. Catch you later. Happy modelling. Hey, welcome again every, everybody to my Kev's Workshop uh, YouTube videos and some of these will be seen on 24trains.tv as well, no doubt. What you see right here, i get my hand here behind it, it's the New South Wales Z57 class loco body. Up here you can see the chassis on the workbench and the front wheels I've got taken out from it because that, that's what you need to do to get the body work off. I'll just zoom in a little here if I can get the correct angle for you. There you are. In a previous video, you'll see the spray painting that I did using automotive um, rattle can, aerosol can sprays. And you get to see the finish. This has been left for a couple of days. And certainly with the finer weather coming along. Warm weather helps out a, a hell of a lot. In a moment, I'm just going to do a few more details to this. And what I intend doing, not only showing you what, or should I say exactly what I'm doing, but how to get similar achievements. With every one of my projects I've ever done, it is an achievement on its own. And to me, success is achieving a goal. And this is another goal that I needed to achieve. And being that it looks what it's supposed to be, I consider that some sort of success. 
So with this, what I'm going to do at the moment, providing I've got the right tins of paint out, nope, wobble, 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 yes, shake the living dickens out of these little enamel cans. I'll just zoom out for you. Little, there we go. Shaking the crap out of one of these little tins. So that's what I'm using at the moment. Humble. Metallic number 11, silver. Now to go inside this loco, it's a small globe which you can buy from what's called J-Car Electronics here in Australia. And J-Car and Electronics both sell these little globes. Grain of rice or grain of wheat are the size you're looking for. And I haven't as yet exactly determined where I'm going to do this. But in the headlight, I've even got it drilled ready. I'll run some fibre optics as soon as I can find out where I've got it. The fibre optics will run right back to about where the steam dome is. Headlight will no doubt be placed back here somewhere. And then I'll trim the length of the two leads as needed. When you buy these, you can get them in 3, 6, 9 and 12 volts. Just having the yellow pair of leads, that's a 12 volt set from J-Car. It's only worth about a dollar or two dollars each, something like that, Australian. But into here, I will be splicing in on one of these two legs a diode, so it only comes on in forward mode. Put me in as a capacitor to go across the pair of them. For memory, it's a 100 UF capacitor, or microfarad capacitor. It's going to run across a positive and negative and it'll have to be up here before the diode because the diode will allow power in but not back. The capacitor going across the positive and negative, if I get the correct one, that'll act like a battery or a rechargeable type battery in that it'll power the capacitor, power the globe, and the capacitor that'll sit back here somewhere will end up acting more like a shock absorber you could say. It'll pick up the fluctuations of power and then by the time it goes from there to the globe, the globe should run at a steady, constant pace. There are a few different uh, ways of doing this. And I might cover that very soon in another video, which I might even attach to this one. So this might, might be done as a series as one video. Might, I might do it as a series of different videos. But that's the globe which I'm looking at putting into here. And the motor terminals on the back of the motor It'll possibly sit somewhere around about that area on the chassis. But we'll come back to that later. And we'll see as to what's happening on this front. Something I've seen done. Now, it's a video up on YouTube, the Wyon Model Railway Club. And what they have done is absolutely fantastic. I am inspired. And with most of my steam engines I've done where I haven't had the chance to get a headlight or where I haven't um, gone to the drama of fitting a headlight you can sometimes paint the insides so that they are white it means that the headlight area stands out and um, by standing out it's like oh wow a white headlight well, realistically, there should be a chrome inside. And this paint, even though I've shaken some of it previously, it still hasn't fully mixed. So just to the bottom of the screen, which you can't see, I'm stirring the, the dickens out of the paint. It's the loco body wobbling on its post. If I bring this up, you can sort of just see there, a bit thick and gloopy. So I'm just trying to thin this out a little bit more by a bit more stirring, a bit more mixing. If I do this properly, I might get a nice chrome insert in the headlight. And being black on black, it's hard to see a lot. Uh, unfortunately, this, every time I seem to get a silver, or a chrome silver, it always seems to go back to being a grey. Don't understand. There must be a lot of grey in the silver mix. Just be 
bear with me a moment. Right, let's hope this goes to plan. As I used to say in the A team, I love it when a plan comes together. Blue tack on top of the post. It's easily removed later on. Uh, let's see how good I can get this happening. Once this is done and the fiber optics installed, there'll be a clear piece of plastic disc put over the end of it to simulate the glass that would have been over the headlight in the real life one. And hopefully, it looks too much of a grey to me, but let's bring this up for you. Sorry, do you want some ugly head? The camera's finding it difficult to pick up at the moment. But, let's see how we go. I might even uh, redo that later on. Not really too happy with the way the way that's come up at the moment, but we'll see how the overall effect comes up later. I'm using a fairly fine brush this time. Uh, we'll see how we go with it. Okay, thanks for this slightly different camera position. My next attempt, you might notice up here some red lining. Yes, I've got paint on my brush already. And in this short few moments, I'll change camera position. There's a red lining that's got to go on. If I bring this one up, hopefully, you get to see it a little bit clearer. To show you how I'm achieving this, that is the end result. So I'll do this a little bit at a time using my smallest, finest brush I've got. I'm just going to do a little bit at a time. All I've got to do is try to concentrate the hardest I can get it where I want it and where I need it without painting everything else. This can be some sort of difficult areas for some people. It's very time consuming, I can tell you that. Try to focus in and get your mind to stay on the one area. It's not always easy. Birds in the trees outside are called the Nip and Spit Brigade. Nipping bits off the tree and dropping them out, spitting them onto the roof of the, the workshop. So don't be surprised if you hear an occasional loud bang. Native birds outside are beautiful. Nice to have them, but. Sometimes it can be a real annoyance. You see how that's coming along quite nicely. All this red lining is going to do is highlight the edge 
by highlighting the edge as it was done in full size. It's like putting pinstriping on a car. It just breaks up the blandness. The automotive spray black I used was matte black, which is great. Depending on what sort of finish you're after, this painting and lining is just one step of the way. So the next part of the video to follow this will be the weathering. I'll get the decals out, the water slide decals onto the loco, and you'll be able to see exactly how to achieve the finish that I'm trying to achieve. It's one of those things where building the kit well there's three months worth just on this kit alone. And people go, oh why it takes you so long? Well there are many reasons and basically you're building a kit and you want to get it right you need to align the model to the photos of the real life and then take it from there and go well right okay what was on the full size at this location and that location and don't forget many steam engines and diesels were modified during the service life so they come in for an overhaul and out looking slightly different to what they were originally manufactured variations like that along the way some parts were added on for improvements, others were taken off because they weren't needed. And the reason why I'm letting you get bored silly watching me do this because you see how I'm trying to achieve a particular uh, goal and you might find there's a better way of doing this but hey, until you've done it you know what works best for you and don't knock it even some perfectionists I still know a, a better way that's fine for those who haven't done this sort of thing before, at least look at what someone else is doing and then go, right, can I achieve that? Is it easy for me to achieve? The idea of this bit of video is so you can make your own mind up and decide whether you are going to be able to achieve this goal. Come on. Good thing about model railways, you learn swear words. Those of you who've been there and done that, you'll understand. When this is finished, all that's going to look slightly different. By the time I add the weathering into it, you'll be able to see as to this nice polished matte black finish is going to change. There you go. 
other side straight to the farm inside my next part I'll try detail inside that cab if I can so bear with me I'll change camera positions yet again okay slightly different whoops camera position if I throw my paintbrush away you see here I'm just doing the back of the tent while I've got the red paint out that's the sort of difference we're looking at so um I don't bore you with doing the whole lot of it so I'll to make a bit of a start so put this red paint away then now we get started on the next stage of it Even on the full size New South Wales D57, I'm led to believe the latter was painted red in most cases, but during the service life, in some cases the paint wore off and was just left painted black. So, if you want to be accurate, you have to find photos of the New South Wales D57, find out what locomotive number and find out more about it. In this case 5711 which is what this loco will become it was painted with a red ladder from the buffer beam down for some part of its life. There might be too many old railway men now still kicking around that would remember these engines in surface but certainly those guys who are still around, some will go, oh, I used to drive locomotive, da da da. This lad was never red. And you get others go, yeah, I remember it. Yeah, Thomas used to climb them back as those tenders. They got the water hatches and putting the water in. Yeah. So it all depends on the locomotive you're modelling, what photos you can dig up. And um, information you can find about that locomotive. The way I've done this tender, the ladder actually locks the top of the bodywork in place. So I've made it loose. The kit suggests we should solder all glue down here, but I'm not bothering because, quite purely, I've left all this top section loose. And to do that, I'm just going to pull the top out, and then I can put a sound circuit in, and that's another part of this project. And then, um, once that sound circuit's put in there, 
should be right to go again. There's some of the detail on the front and top. Now it's not always done, the, done this particular way. I have a vision in my mind from when the loco was preserved back in the 70s. The handbrake wheel was painted red. So from that childhood memory probably was about 78, 79 area. That could have been just something that was done during preservation. Could have been something that was done in service life. So I'm going from a picture in my mind. I never went to the New South Wales Rail Transport Museum, which is to the south of Sydney, a place called Felmere. I remember before the big sheds were built, everything was out in the open. Nothing was undercover. And so being, yeah, the times I climbed not only all over an engine, but within it. Opened the, the water hatch, climbed down inside, and I was having a wander around here in between the baffles. That was fun, until I couldn't get out. <laughs> I found a way and climb up on one of the baffles, get my footing, and climb out. So that was <laughs> 78, 79 at least. Anyway, you can now see that. So, I've, I've purposely not made all this perfect, I've made it sort of imperfect so it gives the impression that it's been beaten around a little bit so if you uh, get a slightly weathered look to it fold it over then bend 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 all the way until you get what you're after and you'll see it's not quite perfect but that's almost like the full size The DJH kit, in this case, is designed. By the way, the wheels actually contour or compensate for uneven track. So uh, this is a little bit tight. This front one, that'll loosen up. The back one's a lot sloppier, of course. But certainly that will go onto the track couple up to the back of the locomotive and we should be right to go. Let me just sort this out a little bit for you and we'll come in a bit closer. At least from that you can actually sort of see the locomotive chassis with the leading wheels out the front. That's easy enough sorted out. I've got the nut and all that removed. There's a spring that goes in underneath here. Let's put the spring and nut in place. Yeah, there you go. Come a little bit closer for you. So there you go. Now all you could do is imagine that with the bodywork on, which is not going to be too far away. So I'm going to change camera positions yet again. Okay, a different camera position. Trusty paintbrush in hand. Umbral number 16. Is it the colour I'm using? This is copper. And what make you wonder where I'm going to use it? It's going to be inside the cab. Hopefully I'll be able to get this such way that you'll be able to see some of the details. So what I'm going to do, while you're watching, I'm going to try to pick out some of the copper pipe work.
inside all this the gauges and all sorts to see so I'm just going to pick out some of the detail stuff that's going to be visible stuff that could be seen as you know let's see what the details like inside this thing So, I'm going to take in some of the pipes, some of it would have been left black, some of it would have been left the copper, and it was, well hopefully we'll get the light in and you'll be able to see it. Turn down the sight gauges in white. So now just picking up some of the details, not all of it. Without being on the footplate of the locomotive, prior to being stripped apart, I can even work on memories, what I recall seeing. So uh, yeah, it's one of those things where you, know, you get a privilege, you think, damn, if I have taken photos back in the day, now they just look back on it and think, shit, so long ago. I don't know if you can see this, but I'm going to try to bring this one up and see how you go. Lighting might not be the best, other than my, my face, but anyway, bear with this and change camera position again. Okay, here we go. Camera's in handhold mode. Now you can see some of the cab detail a little bit better. You just see what I've just been picking out. I have copper piping. Sight gauges, as I say, pressure gauges, they're all in there. We'll come up a bit closer, there you go. Pressure gauges are there in the top right hand side. Sight gauges about the middle. That's some of the detail that you'll find in the DJH kit. Forward reversing wheel there to the left. That's for the power reverser. This is more detail we'll pick out in a while. The handrails you see here on the back of the cab, the left hand side have got a slight bend to it, because in real life there is a bend. But on the right hand side here, I haven't done that bend as well. That gives you an idea of some of the detail that's required. There's a lot that sits up here as well. That's not even on the kit. I can paint that in a little bit later. With the lighting, we can now see this a little bit differently. The red lining that runs the length of the, of the running board. See the actual detail here around the air compressor. This style of air compressor is classed as a cross compound. We're seeing us pumps operating the water injection on one side and steam on the other the steam brakes all the rivet details there, safety valve detail just turn this around a bit has a very nicely detailed model these hand hatch handles that's the correct way they're supposed to be. Three of them, front, middle, and back. The handrail is as correct as I can get it. And there's the headlight. Even though it's supposed to be silver, it's still come up grey. 
and you can see the hole I've put down the guts for the fiber objects to go through. I might even actually run real wires and run a surface mount LED. But for anyone who has a DJH kit, and you're wondering what it's supposed to look like. If you're using FLV player, that's one thing. Goes through video lane. You can actually take snapshots of the video you're playing. So you can freeze frame any part of this video and print it up as a screenshot. That's the amount of detail that's underneath the bodywork. And I'll just put this on the bench out of the way a minute. I shall reunite it with its chassis. There's a closer look at the chassis. Very well detailed. Now the reason for pre-painting all this part earlier is because once everything else is done, it's one less part of the project to worry about. And don't forget, I will be possibly putting a flywheel in place on that um, rubber tubing soon and there's a good chance I'll be converting this across to running DCC sound. So there's the handbrake wheel which you may not have seen too clearly earlier. And you can try to get the shot over the back. I'll have to pull this forward a bit. So now you can see the back end of it. Now I can't clearly see where I'm videoing at the moment because I've got the camera in the way. So what we're about to do now is reunite the body and the locomotive chassis. To show you on this unit here, this is where a spring goes, a couple of washers, the locomotive body screw goes in that little slot at the back. Right, so the body screw is up behind the buggy pivot screw. Who thought that was a great idea? <laughs> and yeah, again, underneath detail for those who may have missed this in a previous YouTube video. I'll give you an idea of how it's done. And this is where the cab gets fixed to the chassis. Those two screw holes there. Show you on the locomotive body. Pick it up safely. There's the front mounting screw hole. It's a piece of etched brass above. White metal casting on the outside of the, the smoke box casting. Slot for the gearbox and motor to go through. The two mounting screw holes. That hole in the middle, I've got plans for that. You'll find on the tender is exactly the same at the front. So let's have a quick sticky beak here at the front without everything else in the way. And underneath the tender foot plate, right in the middle, you see the same sort of hole. I let them open on purpose. In the kit, it shows the end of the auger. Now there's a steam driven auger that runs through. I just just and uh, digress for a moment. Right here, if we can come in close on it, that is the steam powered engine in real life. By the time this thing got fixed in place, you see it's gone at a slight cockeyed angle. It's not meant to do that. 
it's supposed to be a dead level. That's a twin cylinder engine. The steam operated of course. But that steam powered engine sitting under the left hand side driver's cab that drives the auger. Now these locos being such a massive locomotive the auger basically now if I can find a pointing device that'll do the auger comes through underneath here and that runs in real life the auger runs right back to about here somewhere the slope sheet comes down then the auger starts back to here the steam powered auger pulls all that coal in through underneath here underneath the cab floor and if I can bring the loco body up to the bench height for you this area here is the hole where the auger is and that goes from there up into the firebox now the idea of this hole of leaving it blank I shall be running a piece of tubing between the locomotive and tender so it looks as though the auger runs into the firebox as it's supposed to be even though I've got the basic kit the kit is one thing making it look as realistic as I can is the other part of it I'll just sit there for the, for the moment bit of a difference without the chassis I know so let's see to how I go putting the chassis and body back together okay the next step after all this I want to re reunite these two sections together I'll start the weathering not as easy to put this thing together as you expect some parts have to just sit just right for it to happen you've got to come in through steam pipes steam injectors and such without breaking bits off that's where the tricky area becomes Following the weathering is a decaling. And then once you've got the decaling done, the weathering, you go through with the matte coat, which I'll show you in a moment. This can be a right royal pain in the bum to get apart, as well as put back together. It's also a wise idea too that when you come to building all these kits you don't rush it because you can stuff it up so easily. That's got it. It's coming past here without damaging it, that's good. Let's got that in. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Two little minute brass screws. Hard to see in this camera view. Let's see if we can get it in this camera view. A little tiny minute little bugger. Uh, police helicopter flying over again. If they're looking for me, they're not doing too well. I thought that I'd have my address written down. No, exactly. <laughs> uh, my sense of humour.
We seem to get the police helicopters flying over here a hell of a lot. Oh, come on, you can take his beast. So at this point where you want to pick the damn thing up and throw it somewhere just because the screw does not want to go in the hole and stay put. Henceforth, railway modelers do a lot of swearing. A bit like uh, mechanics perhaps. But at least with a mechanic, a hammer solves many issues. Also creates other issues. Cantankerous bastard of a thing. And you shit stand up. Maybe I won't uh, fit the body work on. Not worry about another year, another century. It's such joy once this screw goes into its hole. Now all I want to do is, is fart around. I'm not going to its bloody hole. Some spars out there going, put some fur around it. Yay! Got one in. So we smart enough to get the second one in. Is that possible? Yeah. There you get your mongrel. Keep turning. That's the KBN done. Wee! Got it done in this century as well. So you can see the, the two mounting screws that hold the cab in place. Now for the next challenge. It's enough to drive a person nuts. Somewhere we can get to it later. Hey, that went a lot easier than I expected it was going to. Okay, so for those of you building the DJH kit, there's a body mounting screw for the front. So it's directly right next to the front baggy pivot. So, now for the fun part. Not. My suggestion, the spring they use is too strong. Some people go, no, nah, that's right. So, onto the front 
You may not be able to see that too well. So let's just bring the camera up and try to put it around here. You may or may not be able to see it too well. Let's just zoom you in a bit. Alright. So there's the spring over the bogey pivot. Yeah, let's just widen this thing out here. Onto this is a washer. Right there on the end of my finger. Not the right place for it, but it has to go over that spring. <laughs> One challenge. What I've done with the front bogey, I've actually put a drill hole in behind. You might be able to see that. Oh, come here, you bugger of a thing. Now, I've drilled, drilled in this hole on purpose. One, it reminds me which way is the back end. And two, it will also remind me there's a body screw located above that. If I can get this thing right. Right. <laughs> you might be able to see that. Hopefully you can. There's the spring, there's a washer, the bogey, another washer. Then I go on the end of it. There's a brass nut that is. I'm not a brass nut, I'm just a nut. So there you go. That's what's holding the bodywork in place. Now the other part is you tension the spring and all that, otherwise the spring's too powerful and lifts your front lot of wheels up and you're riding on the rear axle only. So tensioning this to the right tension will get it sitting proper. Now this is not far off being complete. The build is complete at this stage. But without connecting the low antenna properly, put the foot plate down. Now, I'm only just sitting the pair together, not actually connected just yet. But how's that looking, folks? Might be a little bit boring for you, but bear with me while I change camera position again. There you go, the mighty New South Wales Government Railway is a D57 482 Mountain. Any locomotive of this arrangement is classed as a mountain style loco, as far as the wheel arrangement is concerned. It's got four leading wheels, that's what's steering you into the corners. Eight driving wheels, two wheels under the cab, carrying the weight, spreading the load. You can see as we come in here to the cab, I'm actually looking at running extra bits too. Just, to, just for detail, and there's the tender. The only reason why I'm detailing this loco is I found very little information about it on the internet. But I also managed to go through photos and archives. And being a member of the New South Wales Rail Transport Museum, there's information that I managed to get out of the magazines that I get. If I separate these, one little bit of detail, this is going to go on next. Etch brass, builder's plates. 
Let's come down here a minute and have a bit of a sticky peek. The two on the right are the Clyde Builders plates that go in the cab. The two on the left are the Builders badges that go in the tender. I purposely left these till absolute last because they're going to get cut from here in a moment and then put on the cab and on the tender where they belong. So they're the next lot of items to, to be installed on this logo. But I just need all this other stuff out of the way. You can now see yeah, there's an N-Scale 36 in the background, but anyway, you can now see the two brass screws. They go into the chassis, lock the, the bodywork down. And the front body screw, well, you see the nut hanging down. But yeah, up behind there is a front screw. I looked at this from a perspective of being at scale, you'd be really looking up to a locomotive like that. Okay, camera focus doesn't like it, but yeah. Now, the draw bar that DJ H give, let's come around. That's where the power's been picked up through. Right hand rail in this case. There's a right hand side of the loco is picking up power from the track. So the drawbar is picking up from the left hand track, left hand rail I should say. Which comes via the brass pin that's underneath here. Well I've got the camera in handhold position. You see I've brought this bit of pipe work forwards. That's all part of this that's coming down the side. Now I put that there on purpose because what I'm going to do you might be able to see the opposite side. I've done the same thing. Let's see if we can get in and have a closer look. Alright, these two here, I shall be running some wire insulation from those pieces hanging down. So then they'll come in underneath here some other pieces and that'll make it look like it's got the pipe work connected up to the locomotive where that hole is for the auger between the two screws be a piece of plastic tubing going through into the tender which you can see that hole underneath the foot plate that's just like me doing what I do I take an existing kit or proprietary model. Sometimes I can detail it, other times I can't. A lot will depend on what photographic imagery I've got and how clear those photos are. So, let's come back here in a minute. Pop that in. And the next stage of the loco, and the next stage of what I'm doing, will be the weathering. So you have to bear with me for now. For me, it might be another couple of days, but for you, it'll only be a few moments. I'll be back very soon.